This is a reading from Characters of the Reformation by Hilaire Belloc. Chapter 21. René Descartes. In the midst of these political figures, kings and statesmen and soldiers, whom we have been considering in connection with the great religious struggle of the 17th century, we must turn for a moment to two men who had no political power. They were neither soldiers nor statesmen nor men of any hereditary position, but they influenced the mind of Europe so greatly that their indirect effect weighed more than the, the direct effect of others. These two men stood to each other in time as might a father to a son. Descartes, nearly the contemporary of Cromwell, was born in 1596 and died in 1650. Pascal was 27 years younger, but died only 12 years after Descartes in 1662. <clears throat> it is remarkable to note how both of them survived to see the settlement in the political and military fields of the great quarrel between the Reformation and the Catholic Church. On the political field, that quarrel was settled, as we have seen, in 1648-49, the Peace of Westphalia, as the two treaties ending the Thirty Years' War were, are called, was very nearly contemporary with the execution of Charles I, the end of Richelieu's great work, and all the rest of it. In other words, both Pascal and Descartes lived during and past the turning point, and the impress with each one of, uh, which each of them stamped upon European thought was given just before it was too late. That is, while the society of Christendom was still sufficiently warm from the struggle to take an imprint, but no longer in the boiling effervescence of the original conflict. Born a generation earlier, Descartes and Pascal might have been heresiarchs. Both a generation later, the one might have been a mere 18th century skeptic and the other a mere private devotee. As it was, their lives and activities were expended at a moment when they would be of maximum effect, challenging criticism without actual condemnation and influencing the Catholic culture without at first any disruptive effect. These two men represent the effects upon the Catholic culture of two very great forces let loose by the Reformation, or at any rate, let loose by the breakup of the old, united Christian order in Europe. The first was rationalism. The second may be called, I think, with proprietary, with propriety, emotionalism. Both men remained orthodox throughout their lives. Each could claim that he was not only orthodox, but strongly attached to the Catholic Church and all that the Catholic Church believes and teaches. Yet, from them proceeded results which stretched throughout the Catholic culture and shook its stability, while at the same time spreading far outside the boundaries of that culture into the Protestant culture and affecting the whole of European thought. Of the two, it was Descartes who did the most. He was undoubtedly the greater man, indeed intellectually one of the greatest men Europe has ever produced. But negatively, Pascal was also of high effect, because his example and the power of his word fostered that non-rational dependence upon emotion, which is ultimately as disruptive of Catholic solidity as is rationalism. Descartes was the man who started all that mode of thought, which at last, in the 19th century, became universal and is now only beginning to be questioned. The mode of thought which we sum up under the term scientific which refuses to accept an affirmation that cannot be clearly stated and is clearly apprehended by the receiver and refuses also to accept any affirmation, any affirmation, however clearly stated or clearly apprehended, unless it is accompanied by absolute proof based on deduction or experience. From Descartes, there followed, as will, I think, he universally admitted, be universally admitted, that tendency in all philosophy called modern which still lately grew more and more skeptical of mystery, less and less concerned with the unseen, and more and more occupied with matters susceptible of, re of repeated experiment and physical appreciation. When a man talks of the doctrine of immortality, for instance, as a speculation, while calling the chemical constitution of water out of oxygen and hydrogen a fact, he is at the end of a process which was begun by Descartes. Not that Descartes would have put anything so crudely and falsely as that, but from him proceeds the habit of founding cert certitude upon either mathematical truth or physical experiment or the two combined, and nothing else. 
For instance, in that matter of the immortality of the soul, the man who says he will not accept the immortality of the soul because there is no proof of it means that he requires either a mathematical deductive proof proceeding from first principle, from first principles which nobody doubts or can doubt, or that he requires physical proof by experiment. Well, the man who says, I have come to believe in the immortality of the soul since I attended a spiritualist seance is just as much a product of the Cartesian effect upon the world as a man who will not believe in immortality because it has not been proved to him. The man who only begins to believe in immortality because he thinks he has heard the voice of a dead person or has had some other communication with him susceptible of physical test is, in the sense when we are using that word, strictly rationalist. And at this point, it is important to define our terms, for rationalist and rationalism are terms that may be used in many varying senses. We mean by the Cartesian rationalism that habit of subjecting all examination of reality, that is, all the search after truth, to a certain process which is called that of the reason, and the reason only. It is in reality far too narrow a definition of the word reason, but it is that which the great bulk of men still give and still act upon. It is reasonable to accept the evidence of your senses. It is reasonable to accept the mathematical proof. But, they say, it is not reasonable to accept any truth on any other basis. In contrast to this profound effect of Descartes, we mark the effect of Pascal under what has been termed emotionalism. There is nothing out of the way tending to unorthodoxy, inimical to Catholic solidity, in reliance upon emotion. Where Pascal's influence may be called destructive, or at any rate weakening to the strength of the Catholic culture, is in the tendency to substitute emotion for reason, to take emotion out of its proper sphere and give it authority in places, it, in places where it has none. Thus we may say that Pascal, without in the least intending it, stood at the beginning of that recent movement called modernism. And there has been an influence flowing from Pascal, an influence which he himself would have bitterly regretted had he seen its fruits, tending to ignore definition in morals and, de and doctrine because definition is not an emotional process. There has also come from the same source a parallel tendency to deny any doctrine which shocks some emotion, or again to affirm as certain something which the church has not defined, but which suits the private emotion of the believer. When we use the term emotionalism in this particular sense, just as when we use the word rationalism in its particular sense, we mean allowing emotionalism in the one case as reason in the other to do something it was not intended to do, to step outside its proper sphere. Here is an example of emotionalism at war with reason. A modernist, a modernist suffering from the ambient agnostic atmosphere of his time denies what he calls the historical resurrection of our Lord, yet he insists on the spiritual value or spiritual truth as he, would, as he will even call it, of the resurrection. He ends by the absurdity that there are two truths. One, the truth that a thing actually happened, and the other, the truth that whether it happened or not does not count, so long as it creates a pleasing emotion to which he falsely attaches the word truth. Perhaps the most famous sentence of all that Pascal wrote is also the shortest example of this kind of thing. That sentence runs as follows. The heart has its reasons of which the head knows nothing. This is perilously near to saying that emotion is certain of things which reason contradicts. Both men were great mathematicians. Descartes, much the greater. Both men were remarkable writers. Pascal, much the greater. Both Pascal, from Pascal, you may say, comes the whole habit of clear, modern prose writing. And from Descartes comes the whole business of analytic geometry and the theory of the calculi, differential and integral. The process whereby each of these men attained the position he did was very different in either case. Descartes approached the problem of the discovery of truth by a process of elimination. What are we? Whence do we come? Whither do we go? What is the universe? And what are we therein? To answer these prime questions, he began by throwing overboard everything which he felt he could not, in the new scientific temper of the time, affirm, and he reached the residuum that the only thing of which he was absolutely certain, the only thing which he could take as a first postulate, 
the only thing known whence he could which, whence he could proceed to discover the unknown was his own existence. That postulate was undoubtedly true, but it was the postulate of a skeptic, and it has acted ever since as a poison. For there is another thing of which we are also just as certain, really as we are of our own existence, and that is the existence of things outside of ourselves. There is no rational process by which the reality of the external universe can be discovered. All we know is that it can be confidently affirmed. Aristotle, who might be called reason itself, St. Thomas, whose whole process was that of beginning without a, with a doubt and examining all that there was to be said for that doubt before the denial of it and the corresponding certitude could be arrived at, both postulate this second truth. Not only am I, I, but that which is not myself is just as real as I am, and what is more, can be, and is, apprehended by myself. That is, like all true philosophy, common sense. Your plain man, who is made in the image of God, and who, so long as his reason and conscience are not warped, is on the right lines, has no patience with any denial of it. The whole of human society takes it for granted, and must take it for granted. The witness in a court of justice, the man conducting his own affairs, the simplest activities of daily life, takes for granted as absolutely certain not only the external universe in which we live, but our own power of apprehending it. Descartes returned to the very extreme of the old Greek skepticism and said, No, we must begin with the prime certitude of our own existence, from which no doubt we can proceed to a second certitude that the external world exists, but we must not take it as a primal postulate. Therefore, it is from Descartes that the whole stream of modern skepticism flows. He built up a system carefully and accurately from so exiguous a beginning. It was like building a pyramid upside down, balanced upon a point. Yet that system was stable, and indeed on all its main lines it has stood for three hundred years. It included the idea which most men still have of space, of the universe in three dimensions, and three dimensions only, of the value of physical experiment, and the certitude of our scientific conclusions therefrom, of the certitude also of our power of measurement, upon which all modern physical science is built. The philosophy of Descartes remained stable and held the field because it was supported and continued by the rising flood of physical science. In some of his detailed conclusions, he was fantastic and would seem particularly fantastic in modern eyes, but his general spirit conquered the European mind and directed it right on into the memory of men now living. Indeed, no small part of our bewilderment when we hear the doubts or questions of the latest physical science is due to our being disturbed in what we thought to be our quite secure Cartesian philosophy, namely that matter and spirit are quite distinct, and that all time and motion are re uh, referable to fixed standards, and so forth. But there is no denying Descartes' far-reaching influence.